Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible class. We are excited to be here tonight to able, be able to present the word of God. So we will uh, give everyone a few minutes to jump on board and join us this evening. If you don't mind, uh, tag somebody maybe that you uh, want to invite tonight and share the live. We're going to continue teaching on our series, um, Shining with a uh, Servant's Heart. On tonight. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you today for blessing us. Thank you, God, for giving us a mind, a heart, and a desire to uh, to uh, study and to listen to the word of God on tonight. Help us, Lord, to be not only hearers of your word, but doers. We pray for your blessings tonight. Give us revelation and understanding of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Last week, we were, well, the series is, we're teaching on um, for this particular season. We're talking about uh, our theme for the year at Christ Temple is shine. Um, and so we're shining with a servant's heart is the topic for uh, uh, this series. Uh, I want to do a, just a quick review just to see so I can, I can gauge uh, if you all are getting any of this information. Uh, so we're going to have a little exam. Uh, I know you all like tests and things like that, but I just want to kind of do a review from last week. Last week, we, we kind of talked about uh, what is servanthood. And um, so I just kind of want you guys in the comments, in the chat, um, just to kind of put down anything you remember from last week. We talked about what is servanthood, just to give you a clue. But uh, if you can just start anything you remember that we discussed last week, uh, put it in the comments just so I can see what we are uh, retaining uh, before we move on with tonight's lesson. So what do you recall the teachings from last week What we talked about servanthood? Any little, any notes, anything that stood out to you that was said that you remember? I want you to put it in the comments so we can uh, we can all see and and uh, read together. All right, you passed the story. Christ surrendered to serve. Yes, he did. Amen. Anybody else? Anything else? Christ surrendered to serve. You passed the Christ is the ultimate example of serving. That's right. Uh, Sister Shavante, seeking to serve and not just waiting to be told to do something. That's right. Let's, let's, let's find something to do. That's good. Amen. Anybody else? We are shining with a servant's heart. What do we have to do to be the servants that God has created us to be? What is servanthood? All right. That's right. You pastor minister means to serve. Uh, yes, Minister Jasmine, if your eye is single, that means you are generous and bountiful towards the things of God. Oh, that was a good one. Good, good, uh, good one to pull, pull back up. Praise the Lord, Sister Bartlett. Hey, Amen. We are currently just putting in the comments uh, any of the nuggets, any of the teachings we remember from last week. So if anyone has anything that stood out or that they remembered, you can go ahead and put it in the, in the comments. So far, I've got responses from Minister Jasmine, Minister Stewart, and Sister Cervante. All right. One more minute, one more minute. This is, this is letting me know who's taking notes and who's not. <laughs> That's right, Shavante, we are servants one to another. Amen. That's exactly what we are. The ministry is to, to people, and, and we are left here to minister to one another. We're not here to minister to the trees and to the, to the, to the flowers of the field and, and all that. We're here to minister to people, minister to one another. That's right, Brother Lennox. That's a good one. We're here to serve others that God will get the glory. Right. Let your light so shine right before men that they may glorify the Father which is in heaven. He'll be glorified from our serving. Okay. All right. Uh, humility is the path to be exalted. Very good, you pastor. All right, you pastor Stewart. So you, she, she's retained her some good notes and Sister Fonte and Mr. Jasmine. So you all, you all get the A's for tonight. All right. 
All right, we're going to need to get need get need to get high. Need to get high when you can't serve. Um, uh, Deacon Barnett, uh, I think what that's so you're trying to say. Uh, oh, the way to get exalted is to to be, to be to be humble. I know we talked about that. All right, okay, we'll go ahead and get started. That uh, just wanted to see where you all were and uh, retaining. Uh, some of the, the, the nuggets and the teachings that we've been presenting. And so tonight we're going to continue um, with our, our lesson, Shining with the Servant's Heart. Matthew 5, 16 is our foundational scripture for this particular series. Um, never get too high when you can't serve. That's right, Deacon. Good. Uh, that's right. Never get too high to, to, to where you get to the point that you can't serve. All right. All uh, right. But yeah, Matthew 5, 16 is our foundational scripture for this particular series. Let your light so shine before man that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. And so um, tonight we're going to continue discussing this and we're going to be looking at Jesus as the model of spiritual maturity. Jesus as the model of spiritual maturity. Last week I left off talking about uh, I believe in John chapter 13, um, talking about the Lord's Supper. And we talked about uh, what Jesus did at that particular supper. Anybody remember what that what happened there? What transpired where Jesus set the ultimate example before his disciples? Anybody remember what we discussed with that? I thought somebody was going to bring that up. That was my last point, I believe, of last week's lesson. But what did um uh, Jesus do in front of his disciples. Someone can uh, put a little, little quick synopsis real quick in the chat on that um, to see what we, we took away uh, from last week's lesson. And uh, while we're doing that, again tonight, we're going to talk about Jesus being the model of spiritual maturity. So that should give us a hint, right? Uh, you passed the right, wash his feet. Uh, <laughs> dusty woods. <laughs> yes, they were done. Dusty feet. They walked on the dirt roads back then. Um, yes, dusty feet. Dusty, dirty feet. Dusty, dirty, stinky feet, right? But, uh, but what did Jesus do? He washed them. He washed them. So uh, he modeled spiritual maturity for us. So Back in that particular chapter, John 13, um, I want to I want to bring out another point. Uh, let's go there. John chapter 13, verse one. Just as a real quick, I just want to point something out else out here in that chapter. That's right. He did what the lowest of servants would normally do for those coming off the road. That's right. And Jesus, uh, if you remember, uh, so he came in the form of a servant. He exemplified servanthood to his disciples. And what did what did Judas sell him out for? Right. The pieces of silver that Judas sold Jesus out for was that for the price of a slave or a servant. So isn't that something how all that that lines up? All right. John chapter 13. I just want to read. Uh, I think I just want the uh, first couple of verses here. Yes. Okay. John chapter 13. Now let's look at verses about one through three. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. All right. Here's what I want us to focus on. Verse three. Look at verse three. Jesus. What? What's the very next word? Knowing. Jesus knowing. That's very key. Jesus knowing that the father had given all things into his hands. That's key. That's that's one. Secondly, and that he was come from God. That's key. That's that's two. And went to God. That's key. That's the third point that we need to take note of. 
Jesus, verse three, knowing that the father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God. That's his identity and went to God. There's his destiny. Jesus, knowing the father had given all things into his hand. All right. So what are we seeing here? We're finding if we we look at it, note that the source of Jesus's actions, uh, his coming to earth, uh, his his birth, his his death, his burial, his resurrection, uh, his his healing of the sick, giving sight to the blind, the raising of the dead, uh, the feeding of the, the, the multitudes. The source of Jesus's actions lay uh, here in, in verse three. I believe we can we can pull some nuggets from verse three. But it lay in his knowledge and his in the security of who he was and where he was going. All right. Uh, this this look at that. This, this, that's, that's something we must really catch hold to, that the source of his actions. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right. That whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So he came with a cause. But now Jesus is in his humanity on earth. He feels as we feel. He hurts like we hurt. He hungers like we hunger. He has emotions like we do. All right. He's in his in his deity, in his humanity. He is now human. But the source of his actions of what he did uh, lay, I believe, in the knowledge uh, and the security of who he was and where he was going. And so when you read John chapter 13, uh, specifically verse three, we can understand then there that Jesus had um, all the information he needed to fulfill his mission. Jesus was completely aware of his sovereign authority. He knew the authority he had. He knew the power he had, his authority, his origin, uh, and his coming destiny, all right, as he submitted and depended on what God was doing. He submitted to and depended upon what God was doing. And so what are you trying to say, Bishop? It was with this confidence. It was with this confidence in verse three, right? Knowing that the father had given him all things into his hands, knowing that he was come from God, knowing that he would go to, to heaven, go to God, right? It was with confidence that he voluntarily took the place of a slave and washed the feet of his disciples, right? It was with confidence he could do that because he knew who he was. He knew his mission and he knew his destiny. He, his thinking and action really was the total opposite that day. It was the total opposite of the disciples, none of whom were willing uh, to pick up a towel and take a place of a servant. None, none of them were willing to do that. All right. And so when we read uh, John 13, 3, we see three key elements to to the actions that I believe led or supported the confidence uh, and that led to the actions of Jesus Christ. He knew who he was. He, you know, uh, the father had given him all things into his hands. He knew where he came from and he knew where he was going. So that's key. Why do you keep repeating that, uh, Bishop? Because we, too, need to understand that we must understand who we are if we're going to confidently serve uh, as servants in the kingdom of God. Many fall off, many fail to complete their mission, to complete what God has placed in their care because they don't understand with, with confidence who they are, whose they are, and what the mission is. And, and, and even as Jesus did, understanding our destiny and our uh, eternal resting place is going to be, is in heaven. So we have to have that understanding so that we, too, can do ministry with confidence. But the attitude, faith and the uh, action of Jesus Christ portrayed his entire ministry on earth. It portrayed his entire ministry on earth. Let's look at uh, Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two. Just want to read a couple of verses here. Uh, Philippians chapter two, slip down to verse, verse five. 
Remember, we're talking about Jesus being the model of spiritual maturity. So he's modeling how we are to be today, how we are to serve. Uh, and he first did that even in front of or before his disciples. All right. He ministered and served them, showing them uh, how he wanted them to serve. So when we look at Philippians chapter two, um, again, Jesus being our model, being our example, Paul helps us to uh, he reinforces this teaching. He says in verse five, let this mind be in you. That were which was also in Christ Jesus. Now. What was the mind of Christ? <laughs> what was the mind of Jesus Christ? Just based off what we know from the Gospels. Somebody, y'all put help me out. Give me some answers. What was the mind of Christ? If we're just talking about what we read or what we read from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, you know, and, and so Paul tells us, let this mind be. What in the world was the mind of Christ? What was he thinking? What was on Jesus' mind during his earthly mission? I'll give you all a, give you all a couple of minutes to put a couple of responses there in the chat. What was Jesus uh, mindset that yet Paul says, let this mind be in you. So it, it had to have been something that is humanly attainable. All right. It had to be something that we can attain or else Paul wouldn't be telling us to let this mind be in you. All right. Sister Halliburton. Right. We know that humility was on his mind. He was the humble, humble servant. All right. Good. Anybody else? How can Paul make such a strong statement or command of let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus? Such a Savante focused mind, uh, humbled, serving his father. Amen. Of Cheney to do the will of the father. Amen. Uh, this uh, trusty Thomas displaying love. That's right. Carrying out the will of God. Right. Remember when they went back to look for Jesus, baby Jesus, when he's a little boy, they had to go back to get him. And uh, when the, the, his mother and father caught up with him, he said, I must be about my father's business. Um, all right. All right. Minister Tocola, serving, period. Amen. Loving one another. He sure did display love. He was all about souls, people. All right. Good, good, good. Uh, uh, he ministered right to the sick. He healed the sick. Right. Uh, he fed the homeless, fed the hungry, uh, point of decision, all right, Deaconess Towns. And so, so we can see then now uh, when we read verse five, this A clause, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Then we then can see what the meaning of that is. We have to think, how did Jesus function? How did he operate? What type of how, well, how did he display servanthood? So you all gave some good remarks um, in terms of, the mind of, of Christ. But look at verse six. It says, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And here's verse seven. This is something we all have to learn, especially these young ministers today. Uh, but he says, be, but made himself of what? No reputation, no reputation. All right. He made himself of no, he didn't want the, his name in lights, didn't come to set up uh, uh, to be to be a, a king uh, necessarily as they saw a king would be set up in these days. He came, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a what? The form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So that was a that was a, a, a coming down for Jesus. Right. That was a, a, a diminishing move so to speak. It definitely wasn't an upgrade for him to come in the form or in the likeness of men uh, and then being found in fashion as a man. Verse eight, he humbled himself. When we're talking about humility, he humbled himself. Remember, we're talking about Jesus as a model servant. And so he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So it's here in Philippians chapter two that we read about the humility of Jesus Christ. And we read those few verses that we just looked at, we see humility in action. We see Jesus Christ taking down, coming down in the likeness of men, where now he's vulnerable to the things of this world. He left a place of invulnerability, made himself, became vulnerable 
so that he could die for the sins of the world. Who does that? <laughs> Who does that, right? Man couldn't do that. No one typically would take down or leave a place of invincibility to become vincible or to become vulnerable to where your subject, he became he who made the laws, he that spoke the laws of the earth, that spoke uh, the, the, the winds to, to obey his command, he that created uh, the firmaments of the earth, the, the wind, the, st the stars, he caused them to shine in the sky. He who was invincible became vulnerable so that he could relate to us in the likeness of men and, and, and die for the sins of the world, all because the penalty of sin had to be paid. And so Jesus was our man and he exemplified humility. And so when you read Philippians 2, we see him being the perfect example. And so he provides a perfect example of what Jesus wants to do in our lives. This is what Paul is pinning for us in Philippians chapter two. But it also demonstrates how servant living is accomplished even in us. It, all right, it also demonstrates how servant living is accomplished through us, uh, in us through faith and through understanding of who we are in Jesus Christ and by the confidence that we have in the eternal glory of the future. Okay. And so when we have that confidence, then we are then able to, we should be able to confidently perform ministry, confidently serve uh, with the uh, heart or shine with the heart of a servant. Now, I want us to understand that Jesus didn't leave us an example for us not to follow it, right? So let's go back to St. John chapter 13. Uh, so I, we can uh, show, let me go ahead and share my, my screen here. All right. All right. So John chapter 13. And uh, again, this is what we left off with last week. John chapter 13. Let's look at verses 12 through 15, if we, as we have noted there. So remember, we talked about what he did, Jesus um, becoming vulnerable, taking on the form of a servant. He uh, meets with his disciples. We talked about how in those days, he would typically have a servant in the home who would wash the guests, the feet of the guests that come in from the, uh, in, of the house. No one was there to wash feet. The disciples, none of them were jumping up. They knew it was customary to have their feet washed. No one's jumping up to grab a towel and a basin of water to do so. And we know that Jesus then uh, takes off his coat, grabs a towel, puts it around him, his waist, puts some water in the basin. He begins to wash the disciples' feet. <clears throat> now, verse 12 tells us what happens afterwards. He says, so after he washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, he says, know ye what I have done unto you, what I have done to you. Do you know what I just did to you? It says, verse 13, you call me master and Lord. And you say, well, in other words, that's true. For so I am. Verse 14, if I then, and he hits him with the hits with him right here, y'all. If I then, your Lord and master, the one that you call Lord, the one that you call master, the one that you call uh, uh, son of the living God, the one that you call the Christos, uh, then he says, if I have washed your feet, he says, you also ought to wash one another's feet. All right. And so verse 15, he, he seals it. He says, for I have given you an example that ye should do, not maybe or attempt or try. He says, but yet you should do as I have done unto you. So here, brothers and sisters, because I know. Uh, some folks even have a problem when we have communion. Folks have problem washing other saints' feet. Jesus is saying, hey, if I, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, then you also ought to wash one another's feet. 
For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And so, brothers and sisters, we should not have a problem. Now, and I'm, I, I just alluded to or talked about, you know, watch night service when we typically do come together and take communion and wash each other's feet. There are some people that have a problem with that. But when you do that, you're exemplifying the heart of a servant. When you take that tourniquet, you take that water and you wash your brothers and your sister's feet, you are showing forth the example that Jesus exemplified before his disciples and says then that if I did it, you should do it. So you show a servanthood spirit, even at the very moment that you're washing your brother or your sister's feet. Now, we also understand that we, he's talking about servanthood. And so we understand that if he, their master, the one they worship, if he assumed the role of a servant uh, minister to minister to others, then certainly he was telling the disciples, you all must do likewise. You must also take the towel of servanthood because that's what Jesus did. We, when we look at that event as it unfolds, he took the towel of servanthood and ministered to or served others rather than seeking to be elevated himself. And when you look at verse 16 and 17, look what he says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. So Jesus said, if I can wash your feet, all right, then you are no greater than I am. He says, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither that is sent greater he than he that sent him. He says, if you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. All right. And so uh, uh, ironically <clears throat> and contrary to the thinking of the world, true blessings, brothers and sisters, comes in serving others. That's where true serving comes. But that's what Jesus did. He took the towel and the towel of servanthood and he ministered to his disciples. And so what we have to ask tonight when we talk about the towel of servanthood, my question for all of us tonight is this, living as servants, as those who committed to meeting the needs of others, are we committed as, as servants to meeting the need of others with deep humility, all right? Because that's what it takes. It takes deep humility. Are you willing to pick up the towel of servanthood, regardless of your status, regardless of your position in life? Are you willing to pick up that towel of servanthood, wrap it around your own waist? And are you willing to bow down and wash the feet or serve others who are in need? Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, uh, whether you're strong, whether you're weak, whether you, you're brilliant, whether, you, whether you're slow of mind, uh, whether you're a king or whether you're a peasant, I don't care where you fit in the gambit of life. The question is, if you call yourself a child of God, are you willing to be like Jesus Christ and pick up the towel of servanthood and serve God's people? Oh, my goodness. Are, are we willing? Are we willing? Again, contrary to the thinking of the world, true blessings comes from serving others. True blessings comes from serving others. And so I'm hoping that uh, we are, uh, uh, if we're going to be saved and sanctified, if we're going to say that we are born again of the water and the spirit, I hope we have the mindset that we are taking the towel of servanthood and we are serving others. Now, we have to make sure we're serving in the right spirit as well, right? We have to make sure we're serving with the servant's heart. And so when we look at uh, Philippians chapter two, right? We looked at that. Let's go back there for a second. Philippians chapter two. All right. I'm going to look at, uh, start at verse one, Philippians chapter two. Uh, we'll read a few verses here. Again, we're still talking about Jesus, the model of spiritual maturity. Philippians chapter two, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, 
if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies. He says, fulfill you my joy that you be what? Like-minded, like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, that nothing be done through strife, all right? Uh, or, or strife is like contention or vain glory, all right? Empty pride, uh, nothing be done in those manners, but in how? In lowliness of mind. The mind of a servant is of a lowly mind. And then he says, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. All right. We read that, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of, again, no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto the death, uh, even unto death, even the death of the cross. And so this particular passage uh, of humiliation of Jesus Christ, particularly verses five through eight, is really the supreme example of unselfish servanthood um, for the believers. And so again, we look at Philippians 2, we read about the humility of Christ and how is an example that is left for us. The apostle presents uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as one uh, in his, even in his supreme authority, um, manifesting what is the model for all of us today. It's really what Paul is showing us that Jesus did. He's, he's manifesting or displaying um, for us the perfect example of a Christian, how we are to live today. And it points us to the humility needed to live as servants to others. It points us to uh, the humility needed to live as servants to others. So I shuddered saints. I shudder brothers and sisters. When I hear saints, when I hear saints say, I can't deal with people. I can't deal with sister so-and-so. I can't deal with brother so-and-so. I just can't deal with these people, those saints, these folks. I shudder when I hear those words because I know that the reason we are even left here on the earth is to minister to one another. And so the moment you fail or the moment you get the mindset that you can't even minister to one another, what good does God even have for you on this earth? I know that's a tough pill to, but tough pill to swallow, but, but we're finding out that he left us here to be servants. And the moment I cease to serve, then I may be rendering or giving up my seat in glory. My goodness. So we have to church, brothers and sisters, we have to get over ourselves. We have to get over our issues, no matter what somebody does to you, no matter how they do it to you. You cannot fall into the trap of declaring that you cannot minister to others, especially in the body of Christ and in the kingdom of God. So though existing in the form of God, that's what we read when, when Jesus came, came in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So though existing in a form of God with all the rights, with all the prerogatives of deity, <coughs> Jesus emptied himself. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by becoming humanity. He emptied himself. And so this is the expectation. Remember, we read where he did this to be an example to us. All right. That's what it means to take on uh, 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 the, the, the humility, to become humble, to take on the form of a slave. You have to empty yourself. Well, well, Bishop, well, why do I struggle with people then? Because you haven't emptied yourself. Pride is still in there. Some some sense of maybe even self-service or self-gratitude is in there. And I don't want to get ahead of myself too much tonight because we're going to take a little deeper look at some of these things in terms of what's hindering our service or our being a servant. But we need to understand that Jesus veiled or he covered his deity. All right. And he did it voluntarily. He laid aside the right to even use and, and manifest his divine powers. And in doing this, 
He humbled himself that he might die, even the death of the cross, which is what we just read in Philippians. And so this is what Jesus gave up to die. <laughs> he gave up that to die. We struggle to give up some things to serve. And so that's why we have to check ourselves, you know, and I tell you all this often and I'll continue to say it until I, until I go to the grave that whatever God gives you, hold it loosely, hold it loosely. So when God requires it, you have no problem rendering it or giving it up to him. Anything you hold on tight to, all right, is going to become a problem. It's going to become an idol. It's going to become something that God may ask you for that you refuse to give up to him. And what kind of servant are you if you can't even obey or the request of the almighty God? Oh, Lord. All right. y'all. I'm, I'm feeling I'm starting to feel the Holy Ghost. All right. So what is he looking for? Who is he looking for? He's looking for some voluntary servants. He's really looking for some voluntary slaves, folks that don't mind, mind that folks that understand that I answer to a higher power, folks that understand that it's not about me. It's about me serving. All right. And serving with the right heart and with the right spirit and with the right attitude. How dare we serve one another with a bad attitude? How dare we serve each other and be grouchy about it, serving one another? and be just upset because I have to serve. You might as well stop serving if you're serving with the wrong spirit. Sit down somewhere until you get your spirit right and so you can serve in order instead of out of order, all right? And so we wanna make sure that we are doing what God has called us to do. And so when we look at Philippians chapter two, we see Christ's example of humanity. I want us to go there. And I want to bring out something else here in Philippians chapter two, verse one. I want to pull another, uh, extract another thought from this one verse. Look at verse one. We're going to see something that's repetitive. He says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies. All right. Let's read that again. Philippians chapter two, verse one, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, the text brothers and sisters literally contains four if clauses. Did y'all catch that? There's four if clauses. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, and if any bowels of mercies. So we see the apostle Paul pinning verse one, and he's using four if clauses. In the Greek, all right, these are what's called first class uh, conditional clauses, first class conditional clauses, which for the sake of, of argument um, or for, uh, or they were used for to get a response from the reader. And so with the four if clauses here, these conditional clauses do, it assumes the statements to be true. So when you read Philippians 2, 1, it's using the four if conditional clauses, but it assumes that the statement that the if sentence uh, completes is to be true. And so it is what can be called the response condition. It's using the if uh, conditional clause um, to bring about a response from the reader. So Paul wasn't really questioning the reality of these blessings in Christ. You know, that's not why he was saying if this and if that. You know, he wasn't questioning the reality of the, these blessings in Christ, but rather what he was doing, he used the, what's called the first class condition as a kind of uh, 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 rhetorical device, so to speak. Uh, a device uh, in literary terms uh, to get the reader to think through the issue and then to respond properly. So that's really what was going on there. And so the point is this, when you read two and one of Philippians, uh, the point is that there is encouragement, that there is comfort of love and fellowship in ministry and power of the Holy Ghost. And the result of that is compassion and mercy. All right. 
the bowels and, uh, and mercies uh, that all believers should have for others. And that's the, that's what Paul is really uh, alluding to in verse one. So in Jesus Christ, what God does, he calls us, uh, calls all believers to live as servants, serving others uh, with the Lord Jesus being our perfect example. All right. As one who took on the form of a servant. And so really, when it boils down to it, I'm going to take my jacket off, y'all. When it boils down to it, the goal is uh, the goal and the result must be servant living. That's that's the end goal. That's the end game. So we got to be uh, uh, the goal and the result must be servant living. All right. And I believe we can we can accomplish that. We can get to the point to where we are. We're living, but we're servant living. We've taken up the, the, the towel of servanthood and we are serving one another. And so um, in seeking a servant's heart, because we're talking about shining with the servant's heart, uh, we naturally face opposition or opposing forces, right? We, you know, whenever you try to do anything for God, but when you have these opposing forces like the world, um, uh, the your own flesh, uh, the devil himself, right? These are all uh, uh, opposers and all of which are directed toward pro promoting selfish concerns and especially the pursuit. And here's one I want us to catch, all right? The pursuit of significance. Woo! <laughs> the pursuit of significance. How many of us are guilty for doing something to feel important? I want to let that I want to let that breathe for a second. How many of us are guilty of doing something to feel significant? All right. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little deeper here uh, as we get ready to wrap this lesson up. We're going to go a little deeper because I want us to catch. I want us to really evaluate why we serve. All right. Why we serve. Am I serving for the right reason? Am I serving for the right reason? Why? Does selfish pursuits seem to surface, right, for some, even when they're engaged in religious or even humanitarian work? It, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can be doing some things in the church. You can be doing some things in the community. But for some reason, maybe I'm only serving in the pursuit of significance. I want to feel important. That's why I serve. <laughs> All right. We know those that grew up in the church, you know, you're just told to serve. Right. We're told just to serve. But let's dig deeper. Let's let's let let me take the uh, the surgeon's knife tonight and let me just make a real nice, small incision in our hearts tonight to really evaluate why we do what we do. And if we break it down, do we even look at church? Do I come to church because I have to be at church? Uh, maybe I'm a praise team singer and I have to be there. That's the only reason I come. Maybe I'm a doorkeeper. I'm an usher at the church, but I only come on my Sundays to usher, right? Because I'm only coming because they asked me to come on them Sundays. Uh, you know, well, you know, so, or do I come because what I do makes me feel important? <laughs> do I come because what I do makes me feel important? Now, is that serving? Is that uh, is that serving? Is that taking the towel of servanthood? Is that is that emptying myself and serving from a pure heart to just the desire to want to serve and uh, minister to another? No, it's not. Is it? It's not. Not when I'm doing it for significance. Not when I'm I'm doing it because I want to get a pat on the back. And so, uh, you know, we we have to look at that. You know, we have to look at that. And so uh, the real test comes, all right, well, uh, of whether we are truly maturing and learning to become a Christ-like servant is really the true test is how we act when people treat us like a servant, <laughs> right? Right? That's the true test. You, you say, hey, I'm, 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 I'm serving. I'm humbling myself. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this out of a pure heart. But the true test comes when somebody comes along, right, and they're going to treat you like a servant. <laughs> that's the true test. You might be passing the test serving, but when somebody comes along and treats you like a slave, treats you like a servant, how quick do we come out of our humility? How quick do we take off the cloak of servanthood and, and ministering to others and want to be ready to fight, want to be ready to defend ourselves? 
Why? Because maybe it's a sore spot because I'm doing it out of significance because for the need of feeling important versus rather just serving. A true servant is going to take the slap. A true servant is going to receive the ridicule or whatever comes and they're going to keep serving. But when I got a response, <laughs> a derogatory response, right? Oh, I got a question why I'm serving. All right. So in seeking a servant's heart, we naturally face these opposing forces. All right. And so why does selfish pursuits surface for some, even when they're engaged in, like I said, religious or even humanitarian reasons? Why does it seem to come up then? I got two, two points I want to bring out with this. Uh, two examples. I'm only going to go over one tonight, then we'll pick up the second one. It's just Josh talking about my toe hurt. <laughs> <laughs> He's stopping on it. All right. Uh, all right. Hey, man. Uh, so the two points I want to talk about as to why we maybe why these selfish pursuits come or seem to surface when we are serving and engaging in religious or even humanitarian work. Why does it? Why does the selfish pursuit come up? First one I want to talk about uh, is people sometimes too often serve others from their own need for approval and significance. All right. That's the that's that's number one. All right. I'm only going to give two. But this first one is which I believe happens in terms of why the selfish pursuits seem to surface, you know, when we are in a servant mode, because people too often serve others from their own needs for approval and significance. All right. That's that's not why we serve. That's not why we serve. You know, I. I run into people all the time, especially when we get to national conventions and midwinters. There's always individuals that want to be up on the bishops. They want to be armor bearing. They want to do different things. Some do it uh, totally out of servanthood. Some do it just to be seen. They just want to be seen. I'm, I'm, I'm walk. I'm holding the bishop's Bible. I'm ushering the bishop to the pulpit. Look at me, y'all. You know, uh, it's to be seen. That that's not serving. You know, that's not serving. Uh, but we have to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of serving out of our own need for personal significance and approval. Don't serve others out of your own need. Most believers understand they ought to live as servants. We were taught that, we hear that through the scripture, but our preoccupation with our own significance robs us of the ability to serve. If you're so preoccupied with your own, with the, with the, your own need for significance, and there are some that will serve the rubbers off the bottom of their shoes, you know, do whatever's necessary, but they're doing it out of the uh, personal significance, the need to feel important, the need to feel wanted. Some mothers even have babies because they want to feel desired. They want to feel wanted by somebody and a baby gives them that for a span of time. Is that even the right reason to even have babies? All right. That's a whole nother teaching, right? But Part of the problem is that in our society today, such a selfish pursuit is no longer seen as a disorder or selfish. All right. I gonna say it again. Part of the problem in the, uh, today in our society is that such a selfish pursuit is not even seen as a disorder. It's not seen as a problem. In fact, it's not only seen as natural in the world, but it's, it's also presented as a, a legitimate need. <laughs> and something that everybody should pursue. Selfish pursuits. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, hope I, I, hope, I hope I'm teaching tonight. I don't know. Y'all might be mad at me and start jumping off, but I'm, I'm going through with this lesson. All right. But uh, 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 that's the way the world presents it. See, the, the world is always making presentations that, uh, that oppose the scripture, that oppose God, right? The world says, hey, shack with your man, shack with your girl before you get married. So you can see if it's going to work. Right. The world says pursue your desires, pursue your dreams, pursue whatever, you know, uh, you know, none of that gives an example of servanthood. All right. Doesn't really give an example of servanthood. So we have to check ourselves. Right. The danger of self-pursuit is that it produces the opposite of servanthood. All right. The, the danger of self-pursuit is that it produces the opposite of servanthood it produces extreme selfishness all right so brothers and sisters be be self-aware of why you serve 
ask yourself, why do I serve? And if you find that you want to serve to feel important, if you find you want to be, you want to serve to hear your name called, then it's time to repent right now. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I was serving out of selfish ambition. I've been serving out of self-pursuit. I've been serving because I want to hear my name called. I want to feel important. Repent. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to serve because I am a true servant and I just have a desire and a sense of spirit of humility to serve your people as Christ did. All right. So I believe, I believe there are many in the church that really are overly demonstrating servanthood while inwardly they're actually serving in order to feel better about themselves or to gain position or to receive praise and to be accepted. All wrong reasons. None of those were, why, were the example that Jesus set forth for us to truly be service, uh, servants in the body of Christ. None of those. Jesus didn't come. He didn't serve uh, to feel better about himself. He didn't come to serve to gain position. He didn't come to serve and be a slave to, be, to gain praise and to gain acceptance. So we're serving for those reasons and many more that I, I haven't mentioned that we're serving for the wrong reasons. Don't serve just to feel important, but because you love people and you want to please Jesus Christ. That's why we serve. That's why we serve. If the pastor never calls my name, I'm good because I know my future reward is in heaven. My future reward. Remember the key elements to being able to serve with confidence. Jesus knew who he was. Right. He knew why he was sent, and he knew his future destiny. Oh, my goodness. This is what we've got to know, brothers and sisters. Uh, let's get a scripture. Let me give you a scripture. Um, let me see. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let me help you all tonight. Let me help us to understand who we are, right? What we're to be doing, uh, uh, what our future destiny is. Because if we can get a hold of that, then we can pray and ask God to help us to serve with a spirit of humility without having the need for significance in it. All right. First Peter chapter two. Uh, look at verse five. First Peter chapter two, verse five. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Talking about Jesus Christ. Remember the chief cornerstone. Verse seven, unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, be unto them which be disobedient, but unto them which is be disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. So they couldn't, they couldn't stop Jesus. Verse eight, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But then uh, he shifts and he uses a preposition, but. So he just talked about individuals to whom Christ being the chief cornerstone would be a stumbling and a rock of offense to, and, uh, and uh, those who were disobedient, and those uh, whereunto also they were appointed to that. But then he says in verse nine, but he says, ye are, all right? He gives us our identity. Ye are a chosen generation. Ye are what? A royal priesthood. Ye are a holy nation. You are a peculiar people, right? I have my identity in Christ Jesus. I know who I am. I know I'm a chosen generation. I know I'm of a royal priesthood. I know I'm of a holy nation. I know I'm of a peculiar, I'm a peculiar people. But what do I do? Show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
All right. I, brothers and sisters, you have your identity in Christ Jesus. The devil would try to tell you a lie about who you are. But the Bible declares the truth of who you are. And so I don't listen to the lies. I believe the truth. The truth dispels the lies. Don't let the devil tell you you're nobody. Don't let the devil tell you nobody wants you. Don't let the devil tell you nobody, you're not loved. Nobody sees you. Nobody cares about you. You are somebody in Christ Jesus. And when you function and when you operate in the kingdom with that confidence, you can then serve. You can grab the towel of servanthood and you can serve and minister others without needing to feel significant. You can minister and serve others without having your name in lights, without your name having to be called, because you know it's not about you. It's all about Jesus and serving his people. Last scripture tonight, and then we will uh, let you go. Right. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're going to read just a few verses here, Romans 12, and then we will let you go. All right. Romans 12, verse one says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, for I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. All right. Again, that's the humility that we must have. Don't think high, more highly of yourself than you ought to. But he says, but think soberly. All right. Think, think soberly. When that word soberly, it means to think with a sound mind. Think and soundness, think with self-control, think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Verse five, so we being many members are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. We're serving one another. We're members one of another. Verse six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophesied or whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. He says, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on an exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with what? Simplicity, right? Don't, 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 don't give and have all these conditions behind your giving. I'm going to give uh, I'm going to give a million dollars to the church, Bishop Campbell, but I want a, a seat with my name on it in the front row of the church for me and my family uh, uh, until the day we die. You know, that, that, that give with simplicity, give out of humility. All right. He that ruleth, do it with diligence. He that shows mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Last verse. Let love be without dissimulation. Let love be without dissimulation. Let it be sincere. Let it be without hypocrisy, right? Love uh, uh, from a pure place. He says, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. And so we, we, when we see this, we understand that we need to serve. What I really wanted to draw out of that was from verse nine, that let love be without dissimulation. Let your love of serving one another, be without hypocrisy, let it be pure, let it be without any ulterior motive. When I serve my brother, I serve my sister, I'm doing it out of love. I'm not looking for anything in return. This isn't a, a tit for tat ministry. This isn't a tit for tat relationship, but I'm gonna serve you because Jesus was the model servant of Christians for today. And so brothers and sisters, I am through for tonight. Next week, we will pick up with the second point that I want to draw out in terms of why does selfish pursuits surface for some 
even when they're engaged in church or religious or humanitarian work um, and that nature. We want to talk about the second point next week and, and hopefully dig a little deeper here. I pray that you all uh, enjoyed tonight's lesson. Um, uh, I've been enjoying uh, putting these lessons together and studying this, this out myself. And I pray that we are, again, not only hearers of the word, but we're being doers of the word. Jesus, right? Uh, the model servant. So brothers and sisters, I believe we are going to uh, we're going to become the servants that uh, Jesus is calling us to be. Um, Sister Natalie talking about cliffhanger. <laughs> all right. But anyway, God bless you all. I uh, would like to lift the offering tonight. If you were blessed by tonight's uh, lesson, uh, you can go to our cash app. Uh, one of the saints can put that uh, our giving channels in the chat, please. Uh, you can go to our cash app dollar sign CTC Bloom. And or you can go to our website, uh, mychristtemple.net. Thank you. You can see it there in the chat. We would definitely appreciate any uh, any seed that is sown there. But we've been enjoying this lesson. Um, please feel free uh, to be with us on Sunday morning. Uh, we start service at 1130, 202 East Locust Street, Christ Temple Pentecostal Church. And then next week we will be uh, we'll have a, a Bible class again on Wednesday. But then our council session will start next Thursday. All right. So got a busy week next week, but we are just happy in the Lord. And uh, uh, I'm sorry. I hope I hope after I made that little incision that we sold you guys, sold everybody back up that need to be stitched up. All right. Love you all. We're going to pray a dismissal prayer and then we will see you again next time. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight for tonight's lesson. Thank you, God, for teaching us uh, regarding servanthood. I pray, oh God, that tonight that we were charged to take the towel of servanthood, oh God, to begin to serve one another without any sense of needing to feel significant or important while doing so. But I pray that we learn to serve one another out of love and out of the example that you set before us, even as you served your own disciples. Lord, I thank you for what we're experiencing in this season. I thank you, oh God, for where you're taking us. Bless your people on tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, everybody. Love you. Until next time, God bless you.